Without further ado, we're just thrilled to have Greg Tate in Atlanta. It's been a couple of years, so welcome and thank you. And hey, thank thanks you for having me, man. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, as I don't know if it was as advertised, but um, I'm reading uh, from uh, a manifesto, and it's called Kalahari Hopscotch, or Notes Towards a 20-Volume History of Black Science Fiction and Afrofuturism. And it's, uh, the structure is a homage to uh, the novel Hopscotch uh, by the great Argentinian novelist uh, Julio Cortazar. So it's scrambled, and it's, uh, it's broken into numbered uh, vignette segments. And um, I may scramble it some more, because it's really long. So I don't know if uh, I want to subject you all to, to, to all of it. Two, all conversation about black futurism inevitably propels us forwards ever, backwards, and the very on. All black futurism conjures thoughts of a blacker and brighter African past and a bleaker yet more audacious African today in manana the yin and the yang of our cultural language and interplanetary funkmanship. 10. So three questions that have been on my mind a lot recently are, why so much revived interest in Afrofuturism? Why now? And why is there suddenly so much curiosity about black future, about future black knowledge in Germany of all places? Why is it that every time this writer gets invited to speak in Germany, it's to sprechen to the Deutsch on this topic? After a while, you find yourself asking, why are progressive German intellectuals so curious about what American Negroes have to share about the future? Do they really think we precog like that? Think this is the minority report for reals? Imagine we're going to step off the podium, get down in the dirt, do some freestyle Ifa divination form with uh, fin eggs instead of cowrie shells, or what, what, what on the love, love? Or did Ra's omni science myth orchestra really turn the Volk out like that back in those early 70s Berlin concerts? We have several thoughts on this matter, and we'll share, share them a bit later. 11, as a black American male of a certain age and background, I believe myself generationally predisposed to be a black futurist from birth. The now defunct Soviet Socialist Republic sent their Sputnik ro rocket up 10 days before I was born in 1957, thus initiating the race for space between East and West during the atomically anxious Cold War years. The first reading I did as a child was science fiction. The first movies I loved were horror and sci-fi. And like almost nearly every black American male I know born post-World War II, I was a voracious reader of Marvel comics and the disturbed, neurotic, visionary creations of Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, and Steve Ditko, Fantastic Four, X-Men, Spider-Man, The Hulk, Doctor Strange, Black Panther. Parenthetically, Marvel's Panther, T'Chaka presciently appeared in the comics several months before Huey Newton and Bobby Seale launched their famed party for self-defense in 1966 Oakland. And almost simultaneously with the Lowndes County, Alabama self-defense organization, organization founded by Robert Negroes with Guns Williams. Simultaneous with those readings in America's most wondrous graphic literature of the fantastic, we saw how black Americans were out in the nation's streets rioting, rebelling, and rhetorically advocating the creation of a radically and racially transformed America. We saw Martin Luther King envision a future America where the relentless power of organized love would legalize economic and social justice for its people. We heard Malcolm X describe an American nightmare whose resolution would come by either the ballot or the bullet, the briefcase or the shotgun, to use Brother Omar Little's later opposition. What made the science fiction of Marvel Comics more resonant with my generation of young black Americans that all of its superheroes were tormented super creatures full of rage, self-loathing, and anxiety about the state of the world, their own human frailties, and the monstrously and magnificently freakish powers they've been given to combat evil and embrace chaos. For the black futurists who came of age in the 60s and 70s, the vision was always more apocalyptic than utopic. And because of what was going on in our popular culture, which at the time also included our radical culture, the Panthers and the black arts movement, as well as Parliament Funkadelic, the future seemed to be already moving in an Afrocentric direction, one where post-civil rights middle-class black America was already living and thriving, at least in the concert arena and on the dance floor, even as the post-King riot corridors other multitudes of us lived in was visibly beset by spirit-strangling poverty, ecological ruin, and walking dead dope fiends. For those of, 
for those of us of a progressive intellectual bent, black music, acoustic and electronic freedom jazz especially, black feminist literature and reggae became the beacons of infinite trans-dimensional creative possibility that superseded the demise of the black power movement. Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, Tony K. Bambara, Gail Jones, and Intazaki Shange became the first set of black women creatives we believed to be on a par with Sun Ra, Miles Davis, and Bob Marley. For those of us who studied under Holly Dream at Howard University in the late 1970s, Third World Cinema, C.L.R. James, Franz Fanon, and Amakal Cabral further expanded our connection and understanding of a black futurism, the field's widening vistas, and utter disregard for intra-ethnic boundaries and forever receding horizon line. The history of Afrofuturism and black sci-fi is rooted in the coterminous histories of pan-Africanism, black radical politics and poetics, black music, critical film studies, and the dual tradition of the black American novel and that continent-wide African literary tradition from Achebe to Tola and Soyinka to Emicheta Head and Ngugu. Seven, the defining trope of African American literature is invisibility, not just the invisibility produced by the white social gaze during and after slavery, but as well the invisibility and the voids and the silences and desires and apprehensions produced by gazing too deeply within the black American self for too damn long. It's for this reason that our literary tradition has always been more prophetic and phantasmagorical and surrealist than, a social, than social realists or even super realists. This recognition also helps ex explicate why the black American canon reads like a litany of ghost stories about various manner of fantastically radicalized ephemera. The confessions of Nat Turner is told to Thomas Gray, the mystery, the North Star, the autobiography of a slave, the bondswoman's narrative, Blake or the huts of America, we wear the mask, sports of the gods, the souls of black folk, autobiography of an ex-colored man, the conjure man dies, their eyes were watching God, mules of men, tell my horse, native son, the long dream, invisible man, if he hollers, let him go, go tell it on the mountain, Giovanni's room, the fire next time, the system of Dante's hell, the Dutchman, blues people, the autobiography of Malcolm X, soul on ice, revolutionary suicide, blood in my eye, blind man with a pistol, if they come in the morning, the quality of mercy, black magic poetry, shadow and act, Dunford travels everywhere, the catacombs, scarecrow, sister X and the victims of foul play, groove, jive, and bang around, the wig, the bluest eye, the color purple, for colored girls who've considered suicide when the rainbow is enough, beneath the underdog, bloods, in search of our mother's gardens, sassafras, cypress, and indigo, daughters of the dust, rhinestone, rhinestone sharecropping, beloved, corregidora, mumbo jumbo, I am a cowboy in the boat of Ra, Axis bold as love, electric ladyland, band of gypsies, last days in time, rainbow bridge, Nova, Dahlgren, it's after the end of the world, don't you know that yet, maggot brain, the mothership connection, the clones of Dr. Funkenstein, stars in my pockets like grand, grains of sand, all night visitors, things that I do in the dark, reflex and bone structure, scarifications, I to tuba, black witch of Salem, devil in a blue dress, wild seed, parable of the sower, the healing, negrophobia, the white boy shuffle, the life and death of Oscar Wilde, Joe Turner's come and gone, who fears death through the valley of the nest of spiders, the broken kingdoms. These titles, seen in total, do not suggest the, letter, the literature of an oppressed people, but the literature of a shamanistic and mystical people, the literature of a hoodoo, voodoo, and a what the fuck are you people, you people whose writing doesn't distinguish between excoriating the living, conjuring up the dead, or projecting rose-colored, dreamy-eyed thoughts about Armageddon. Your literature seemingly composed by a race of angelic aliens already fallen to earth and breeding like rabbits. 13. Black futurism is a temporally troubled matrix that thrives on opposites and oppositions, flowing lines and nonlinearity, conflict resolution and asymmetrical warfare. It prefers the mad dash on shifting sands while in pursuit of higher ground and safe havens. Such are the creative benefits black futurism has been bestowed by the implosive depths of black trauma, black liminality, and the sharp edges of black transcendentalism. Black futurism is simply put how human truths crushed the earth, rose to engage in intergalactic mythopoeic warfare in the 20th and 21st centuries in the common era. This was primarily by mutating a nation of nobodies into more than the punchline of a brilliantly ironic Burt Williams song. By seeing institutional exclusion, hyper-invisibility, 
and massive social erasure, not as impediments, but as incitements. Black futurist avatars are inspired to repurpose oppression and recreate the world anew every goddamn day. 16. As Morpheus illumined about the matrix, black futurism is everywhere around us. One, the, fu the question should never be, what is black futurism? The question should be, well, what is not? 12, having ceded the racial ground war to the, the Enlightenment era imperialism somewhere back in the 17th century, black futurism determined that the fiery realms of the symbolic and the mythic and the rhetorical and the spiritual and the wickedly stylish, sonic, and polyrhythmic would become our culture's bailiwick raison d'etre and culturally triumphalist battleground. Nine, race, not space, looms as the final frontier. Black people didn't need to wait for late 20th century genome science to figure out that race as we know it was a convenient social contraction of black eternal being. Six, no overseer or plantation owner is a hero to his valet. No man who needs slavery to feed his empire can much impress his coerced labor force with claims to dominant supremacy and master race status. The degree to which notions of white supremacy took hold of the slaver's delusions about himself make him a worthily psychopathic opponent, but hardly an invincible or unassailable one. Central to the master-slave paradigm is the belief that fellow homo sapiens were in fact no more observant of human foibles than horses or garden tools. Who but a lunatic would make laws that forbid his shovels, rakes, plows, and hoes from running away? Or demand that those farm implements present identification when traveling between plantation stations? Or cut off the hooves of recaptured fugitive horses to frighten any of their named stable mates who also might imagine going AWOL? Four, the early foot soldiers of the black futurist army who became captives in antebellum America knew that the inscribed presence of black consciousness alone was enough to disrupt the slaver's impossible task of subhumanizing black folk. I think, read, and write, therefore I am not a slave, became quick, quickly grasped as the primary operation by which the owner's fragile view of humanity would, would unravel and eventually become undone. Five, Fred Moton's most crucial critical intervention into Marxist economics and post moton Marxist labor theory as well becomes of paramount interest here. Moton demands Marxist disciples reconsider the riot of ruptures that must occur when the theory must entertain the fact that commodities can speak, not as a speculative fictional what if, but as an incontrovertible and undeniable biological fact. When the monster speaks, all bets are off for the slave system social engineers. This is why the incendiary David Walker's appeal published in 1830 was banned, less than as, as an incitement than as a dangerous idea in southern states where most folk of any hue were illiterate or, or barely literate. The thought crimes expressed in, this pa in these passages from Walker's Jeremiah out of a word juju serve to explain why. Quote, if you commence, make sure you work. Do not trifle, for they will not trifle with you. They want us for their slaves and think nothing of murdering us in order to subject us to that wretched condition. Therefore, if there's an attempt made by us, kill or be killed. Now I ask you, had you rather not be killed than to be a slave to a tyrant who takes the life of your mother, wife, and dear little children? Look upon your mother, wife, and children and answer God Almighty and believe this, that it is no more harm for you to kill a man who is trying to kill you than it is for you to take a drink of water when thirsty. In fact, the man who will stand still and let another murder him is worse than an infidel, and if he has common sense, ought not to be pitied. From the moment commodified speaking Africans realized they could violate the delusions of white exceptionalism, the foundational physics of the owner's universe by thinking alone, Next came the realization that they could organize revolts, incite rebellions, Haitian revolutions, act out Nat Turner's counter-genocide plan, or engage in 35-year-long Seminole Maroon Wars against the U.S. government. From those days forward, the game of white supremacy was conceptually lost to, American, to the American continent's self-appointed master race. 14. All that we call black art and black music and black history and black culture and the black experience in America is actually an alternate reality built upon the impoverished ruins of the white supremacist imaginary that summoned it into being so perpetually badass. The very badass black American film director Melvin Van Peebles likes to speak about the benefits of living in a racist country. He said, we always talk about the downside of racism, but there's an upside to racism as well. When people think you're stupid, you can do anything you want to. 17, 
What black futurists think is that all of America belongs to our Welton Chong and all of Western time as well. Black futurists believe as Sun Ra instructed, it's already after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? Black futurists are like what public enemies Professor Griff said, Armageddon has been in effect, go get a late pass. Sun Ra envisioned no difference between a paradise lost for African people and his notion of a trans-dimensional intergalactic African utopia. Both were dream worlds where black people wouldn't be lynched by hordes of white nuclear families seeking a little roasted darkie and entertainment while out on picnic. 21. In the mid-1970s, when George Clinton toured Parliament Funkadelic's Mothership Connection Starship to arenas like Washington, D.C.'s 18,000-seat Capitol Center, there are very few white people to be counted among those 18,000. This is a time when the population of the nation's capital was 70% African American, and Dr. Funkenstein could righteously and rightfully declare God bless Chocolate City and its vanilla suburbs. If one was raised as this reporter was in a black futurist utopia like 1970s DC, or CC, Chocolate City, you understand black culture as a thing in total, as a unified field theory best described by such critical race referendums as black cultural nationalism and pan-Africanism. Within this alternate, alternate reality construct, any and everything that had ever been conceived and executed by a black imagination for local and global consumption was grist for our critical and performative meal. The song lyric that best describes the black futures program from a critical performance vantage point is the Clinton verse that goes, we have come to reclaim the pyramids, partying on the mothership. What Clinton locates for us in one scrap of one scrap of scrappy verse is that black futurism is just a name for African epistemology and that like Emma Goldman says, if I can't dance, then I don't want to be part of your revolution. 19. The greatest dancing rebel in American history was the godfather, James Brown, the alchemist who transformed funk from an adjective to an action word in a state of being, a transcendent body in motion. George Clinton, however, was the dude who honest that force and converted funk into a hood massive post-black power semiotic movement. Here's our chance to dance our way out of our constrictions, Clinton says in another song, while in the third he postulates that, quote, with the rhythm it takes to dance to what we have to live through, you can dance underwater and not get wet. 20. In the wake of American housing's post-prime lending apocalypse, we cite the phenomenon of underwater mortgages, contracts between home consumers and banks that force the consumer to cover the loan shark banks lost on a loan for a now worthless property. Statistics show that black and Hispanic homeowners are the disproportionate victims of those loan extortion policies and thus more viciously subject to mass foreclosure and home ownership exit. Any black futurist project that did not ask how dancing underwater while not getting wet was working out for those made homeless by the Bush administration's subprime loan policies would be irresponsible and useless to the struggle for social, social justice not to mention pointless and politically speaking, too precious for words. 23, black futurism should be nothing but not observant about race and power relations in this historical moment. A moment which our friend Vernon Reed has declared is not a post-racial America, but instead a most racial America. Black futurism implies the dissatisfaction with the black American status quo that must be mediated by aggressive magic and science and supported by George Clinton's market savvy colloquialism, rhythm, and business. A necessary footnote here would be black futurist free jazz icon Cecil Taylor's response to the question of what he thought white people would never understand about black culture. Quote, the magic of rhythm was Taylor's typically pointed yet mysteriously reply, mysterious reply. 25, this emergent field that we call black futurism must be considered a set of narrative operations that unfolds in four or five dimensions simultaneously. There are the many documented artifacts and avatars of black futurism we know from music, film, and literature, the canon as it were. There's also a need to recognize black futurist claims on a historical timeline from the karma dated birth of proto-human life and society in South Africa's Kalahari Desert one million years ago during the tool making kinship forming fire creating time of so-called Java man. Black futurism recognizes the origins of human language, consciousness, art, music, and spirituality among our oldest chromosome-dated human ancestors, the Khoisan people of the Kalahari, especially as their elegant and stylish cave paintings depict dreamtime encounters with elongated transhuman transgenic hybrids. Black futurism also notes the appearance of what has been described as a, quote, natural nuclear reactor in Gabon over two million years ago, 
We also note that the godfather of soul, James Brown's favorite place to visit in Africa was Gabon. Coincidence or natural attraction, synchronicity or elective affinity. The history of black futurism is not shy about reclaiming the pyramids nor the Great Wall in Zimbabwe or any of the Nilotic, Nilotic Valley cultures that produced the Kushite Empire, the Nubian Kingdoms, and Pharaonic Egypt. Nor can it avoid the cosmology source material known as Vudon in Benin Dahomeyan uh, worship in the Yoruba speaking cultures of West Africa. A poignant note here is the astronomically correct interstellar references found in the divination and belief system of Mali's Dagon. There is also to be considered the supposition that Benjamin Banneker, one of America's first great polymaths, mathematician, clockmaker, astronomer, and architect, was the progeny of a Dogon born father and an Irish mother. These connections, too, are not lost on this black futurism, nor is the centrality of Vodun belief systems, Vodun belief systems to the strategic successes of the first successful revolution led by blacks in Western history on the island of Haiti, Santo Domingo. 15. Given the appearance on the antebellum scene of Moses Dixon and the Knights of Liberty, a black Masonic secret society over which Dixon presided and which is said to have freed 70,000 enslaved Africans and alleges to have organized 50,000 free black men to march into Atlanta to crush the citadel of slavery by force. The banning of David Walker's appeal can be deemed both logical and ineffective. Of course, Nat Turner needed neither Masonic freemen nor Walker's fiery diction to become inspired to war against slave owners. Black futurism couldn't help but be moved by the fact that Turner's inspiration for radical insurgency was driven by visions of dark and light angels warring over a cornfield and dripping esoteric writing in blood on leaves and stalks. Black futurists also claim a precedent for their field in the esoteric names chosen by famed black American abolitionists Martin Delaney and Frederick Douglass for their newspapers, respectively, The Mystery and The North Star. We must also applaud Delaney for composing what was surely the first black science fiction novel in America, Blake or the Huts of America, about a fugitive super spy who travels around the southern US and Cuba fomenting anti-slavery rebellions. Black futurism later finds its first real life super spy, however, in the person of the woman known as Black Moses, Harriet Tubman who will personally rescue over 1,000 American-born Africans from American chattel slavery and lead them to a fraught promised land. During the Civil War, Tubman leads the legendary 1863 attack on the Combahee River Plantation in South Carolina that will liberate 700 of her people. Tubman gathers intelligence that serves to sweep the Union Army into a battle replete with modern and archaic weaponry, swords, guns, sea mines, bombs, bullets, and ship sinkings all converge in a scene spectacularly worthy of any James Bond thriller climax. Before Tubman leaves this mortal plane, she offers, offers us these wise cautionary lines about the colonized black imagination. Quote, I have freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more if they'd only known they were slaves. In Dreams begins responsibility would seem to be the battle cry of black futurism long before Delmore Schwartz uttered the phrase. What we have from the beginning of the genre is a recognition that reality would have to be repurposed to accommodate a nation of very active dreamers, starry-eyed and Bible black dreamers at that. Consider that Harriet Tubman pre-echoed words spoken dec decades later by Martin Luther King as he stood on the steps of the Washington Monument and delivered his somnibuliantly inspired prophecies. From Tubman, every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember you have within you the patience, the strength, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. I'll stop there. You know. mm. Mm.